afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for being here, for making the time out of all your busy schedules to be here. We really appreciate it. My name is Jakub Barnard Nordia. I'm the acting head of the Department of Private Law and also the co-director of the Center for Rhetoric Studies. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the annual Ben Beinart Memorial Lecture. Um, the lecture is named for Ben Beinart, who, as some of you may know, held the WP Schreiner Professor of Law at UCT from 1950 to 1974. So for 24 years, Ben Beinart was a presence and a force in this faculty. The lecture provides an opportunity uh, to the faculty to host a distinguished local or international figure on a law-related matter. And this year, our um, esteemed guest speaker is Professor Reingart Nethersoul. While the topic uh, would need to have academic reference, um, the, the remit of the lecture states, that the idea is that the lecture is presented in a format accessible to law practitioners and faculty friends. So um, that is what we hope to achieve tonight. We would very much like to thank Weber Wenzel for their continual, continuous gener uh, generous sponsorship of the lecture for many years now, um, which has ensured that we have been able to bring international speakers to UCT Law and host lectures even for a day, lecturers even for a day or two. Um, the support has ensured that we are able to continue attracting top legal minds locally and internationally to participate in this annual event. Now, how the Binart lecture works is that it rotates between the three departments. So every year, um, at one of the departments, we have three departments in the faculty, commercial law, private law, and public law. And each year, one department gets a turn to host the lecture. This year, it fell to private law to host the lecture. And um, as a matter of coincidence, really, <coughs> it also has so happened that the faculty's annually published journal, Acta Juridica, is also um, appearing out of private law this year. So before I say a little, little bit more about Acta Juridica, let me just say um, a welcome, a special welcome to those representatives from Weber Wenzel who might be here. I was told that Giles White Actually, is here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much for being here and um, again for the sponsorship of the lecture. So to come to Acta Juridica for 2022, um, we decided when when it so happened that the Ben Beinart lecture was part of uh, or okay, had to come out of private law this year, and the Acta Juridica was coming out of private law. We decided to combine the two into the Ben Beinart Memorial Lecture and then the launch of the Acta Juridica for 2022, which is entitled "The Incomprehensible: The Critical Rhetoric of Philip Joseph Salazar." And here it is for those who haven't seen it, and it will be on sale after the after the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what is this book? What is the incomprehensible, the critical rhetoric of Philip Joseph Salazar? The the first thing that we wanted to do in this uh, in this volume of the of the um, Acta was to really celebrate and mark um, Philippe's singular achievements in rhetoric, um, but also his very long 40-year career at UCT. And so we decided Philippe moved, as many of you will know, moved to the law faculty about five years ago. Is that right, Philippe? Um, moved to the law faculty about five years ago, and he became an intricate member of the and valued member of the Department of Private Law. And so we wanted out of private law to honor Philly. And so we decided to bring together 12 essays in honor of Philippe's scholarship. And in the work, um, we explore Salazar's relationship with the incomprehensible, and that's why the title is The Incomprehensible. Um, because Salazar's relationship with incomprehensibility in rhetoric, philosophy, and, um, and politics has been both variegated and profound. 
Um, the journey begins at the end of the 70s when Salazar traveled to apartheid South Africa on the advice of his mentors in Paris to study the discourse of racialization while it was being actively and concretely practiced as state racism. Now, many of you uh, would think about, I mean, I, I say in the introduction, um, this, this initial move um, of Philippe's in his career to move at the end of the 70s to apartheid South Africa from the well-heeled city of Paris, where a uh, very promising career was, was, um, was um, rising. Um, that move is already a kind of, um, I call it tarrying with the incomprehensible. There is a certain incomprehensibility about what possesses <laughs> someone to do that at that time um, in world politics and in world history. So that is the, the first kind of um, initial moment of incomprehensibility that we kind of riff on um, in the rest of the, of, of the volume. Now, since then, of course, Salazar's contributions have never strayed from the study of the incomprehensible languages, discourses, rhetorics, and philosophies that marked the end of the 20th century and continue unabated in the new millennium. The volume aims to illustrate further that Salazar is, a, is as much a rhetorician of technologies of power, those in rhetoric regard Salazar as a rhetorician in the tradition of technologies of power, but he is also, the volume claims, a critical rhetorician. Now, what do we mean with it, that he is a critical rhetorician? We basically, uh, you, I use Brunage's work uh, on um, psychoanalysis and rhetoric to claim that Salazar is a rhetorician who has moved through the bases of semiotics and psychoanalysis in order to step out of manufactured common sense, as we now have it so pervasively in media and social media all over the, all over the planet, steps out of manufactured common sense altogether so as to apprehend the repressed and repressive aspects of such common sense and of ubiquitous common places. In a career spanning over more than four decades, Salazar has, so the volume argues, he has tarried with the incomprehensible to the extent that the, his entire oeuvre can be collected under the signifier of the incomprehensible. The collection also highlights Salazar's deep interdisciplinarity, and I think it is a testament to his interdisciplinarity that we this year have a non-lawyer presenting the, um, the Beinart lecture. It uh, testifies not only to Salazar's interdisciplinarity, but also to the increasing interdisciplinarity that we find ourselves in in the academy, um, but also in our efforts to apprehend an increasingly complex world. And um, that is why I think uh, we've not just, it doesn't just so happen that we have a non-lawyer presenting the Beinart lecture. It is a kind of a symptom of a reality that is increasingly gaining ground. Um, now, to just uh, tell you something unique about the volume, um, we decided to break with the conventions of the Feshschrift as it is normally done in, um, in South Africa, but also abroad, um, in that we have included a new essay by Salazar himself in his own Feshschrift. <laughs> and um, we do, and we did this to honor and celebrate the fact that Philippe is still a highly active um, contributor, interlocutor, um, and, and discussant, and author, um, uh, above all. And so uh, we wanted to reflect that activity um, also through this volume. So um, in the end, we honor and celebrate the critical contribution that Salazar has made to the future of rhetoric internationally, continentally, and locally, while also challenging current debates across disciplines to newly confront discursivity and rhetoric 
with the seemingly incomprehensible demands placed upon us by an age in which politics and language, and I would also add law, as definitive of humanity, have become increasingly precarious. So <clears throat> that's then the project that underlies tonight's lecture, and the project that we um, have now concluded and that we would like to celebrate as well. Um, but uh, uh, above all, uh, this is a celebration of a scholar whose contribution is um, simply um, uh, uh, indescribable, in fact, um, in terms of both its quality and its quantity. Um, and so, um, before I hand over to Judge Davis to um, tell you a little bit more about Ben Beinart as a colleague and a friend, um, let me just say that there is more law in this volume than you think there is. Um, the law doesn't take a front seat, that's for sure. Rhetoric takes the front seat. But the implications for law that are elaborated in the volume are profound. And so I think it is a volume that can be read by lawyers um, and that lawyers can take a lot out of or from. And so I would encourage lawyers who are here tonight to think of themselves as lawyers first and everything else second to also perhaps engage with the incomprehensible. Thank you. Um, before, before Judge Davis speaks, Judge Davis, of course, needs no introduction, so that's why I'm not introducing him. <laughs> but um, in any event, we are very glad that Dennis agreed to share um, his memories with us tonight. And um, so, just to quickly say something about Dennis, now retired as judge of the High Court, but a prolific author of on topics from tax law to rhetoric to lawfare to jurisprudence, um, and a, a dear co-lecturer in the jurisprudence course with me, um, and a colleague who I value very dearly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words about Ben Bernard. I want to just start by saying it, it, that when, when I was a student and Ben Bernard was my teacher, I mean, he was an absolute, I see Rob Peterson here was also taught by Ben Bernard. He was a dominant figure in our faculty. I mean, I remember as a young student going to a law dinner in the days when um, not only final years went to the dinners because of the small classes. And one of the final years saying to me how lucky we all were that we, were, that we were in a faculty in which Ben Baynott was there. It sort of, it made it a world-class faculty. And what was amazing to me, if I may say, is that Ben left UCT in 74, and I would want to venture that by about 1980, when students walked past his photograph, they wouldn't have even known who he was. And it kind of made me very sad that people, he came here in 1950, he reconstructed the curriculum of the law school. Uh, he was the major player in the law school throughout certainly my student days. And the, at WISP, he was forgotten. And so the fact that, one, we do have a lecture uh, in his name is, is important. But perhaps more important is that you've given me an opportunity, not just me, but an opportunity to tell people here, a lot of, well, almost everybody who's younger than me here, uh, sadly, uh, that, that about who he was, because many of you would not even know that. And that's quite important, it seems to me, that we do hold on to the memories of people who made a significant contribution to the institution of which we are a part. So Ben Baynott, um, he was a truly very significant scholar, and I invite you to have a look. Um, a fesh script, you, you talk about fesh scripts. This was very traditional fesh script, I accept. Ben ben there were so many people who wrote in honor of Ben Baynard when he retired from UCT that three volumes of Actu Ridica, 1976, 77, and 78, 
were all devoted to the fish script. And I invite you just to look at the contents page. Now, people from all over the world, from Europe, from Oxford, from Cambridge, from America, and many from South Africa, writing in his honor on a whole range of topics. Because Ben Bannott was one of these curious characters that although he was a professor of Roman law, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment if I may, um, he also wrote about many other things. In 1948, he wrote the first article, to the best of my knowledge, on administrative law in the Tate script. And in 1962, he wrote for me what is still, I think, from a liberal position, um, the finest article that I've ever read on the rule of law in the 1962 Acta Juridica, which is an absolutely magnificent article. And I was paging through um, uh, the Acta Juridica yeah, because I suddenly remembered that in 1981, which was um, uh, some years after the Feshgrift, uh, I, I, I'd, I'd come here in 77, so I was a bit too late to contribute to it. I wrote an article on the rule of law and, and Marxism um, in, in response to Ben Bannott, I went to have a look at it now. I thought, gee, that's not as bad as I thought it was. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was a very Marxist article about, uh, which from Ulthasa to Kulansas and a whole range of other, uh, and Marx himself, engaging with the fundamental proposition of the rule of law. So he was a person who, to a large degree, wrote about many issues. And there were two aspects I'd like to share with you about his intellectual stuff, but I can't then help but not say about the character of the man, which was quite unique. Ben Baynard said in 1950, when he came to this faculty, fascinating, every subject in my view, he wrote, should have an underlying theory and a critical approach, even procedure and evidence. He was probably 60 to 70 years ahead of his time, because to this date, we still do not teach all of law through a critical underlying theory. We really don't. And that's what he said in 1950. And I think that's really interesting that that was the perspective he had. He also said um, in his inaugural lecture in 1952 on Roman law and South African practice that we need a class of lawyers who are aware of the past, but as well as the needs of the present. And it seemed to me, it seems to me still to this day, that's the challenge of a law teacher. That we do need to know about the past in all sorts of ways, but we also need to equip lawyers for the present and the future. And so in many ways, Bannot was quite a unique character in relation to that. And he was my teacher. He was the most disorganized teacher that the law school has ever had until I arrived. Um, <laughs> um, so much so, that the joke about him was that he'd have, there was going to be a book on administrative law, and everybody said it would begin fifthly. <laughs> what the first four points were, because when he gave a lecture on jurisprudence, it sort of just emerged in a, in a sort of strange way, and it was a, a sort of somewhat in a disorganized fashion. And yet, on the other hand, one learned quite a considerable amount. I, <laughs> there's a story told about Ben Baynott, um, that Geoffrey Jarl, who, uh, Sir Geoffrey Jarl now, a very distinguished administrative lawyer, was his student, apparently had a very fancy watch which had a bell. Now, in the old days, when we were uh, taught at the arts block at UCT, at the end of each lecture, the bell would ring. And apparently, Geoffrey Jarl set his bell for five minutes before the end of every lecture which meant that Ben only spent for 40 minutes because he didn't work out that Jeffrey's bell was not the real bell and students got away five minutes early in each and every lecture. It's also true that he had a particularly contemptuous view of if it were the bureaucrats who ran the university as opposed to the academics. Ben was a notoriously unpunctual person. And the story is told about um, uh, Hugh Amor, who was the registrar at the time and uh, sort of knows about everything about this university's history, tells the wonderful story that Ben, who was then the deputy uh, principal of the university, um, would come to meetings, the one to two o'clock meetings at Bremner with uh, various council members, particularly the chair and deputy chair of council, who in those days did not seem to need to resign. Um, um, and and, and uh, he... Uh, he would always arrive late, 10 or 15 minutes late. And um, eventually the registrar, MacDonald, was instructed to tell Bernard that he should come at one o'clock. So MacDonald knew that Ben was a very formidable fellow. And so he said to, 
he said to uh, came and he said to professor the businessmen meaning um clive corder who was the chair of council and frank robb who was the deputy council are getting particularly irritated by the fact that they have to come up from town to meetings and because you come late the meetings extend far beyond their expectation they've got to get back to their businesses and ben said in that mom's reaction to these he said listen i want to tell you you go tell clive and frank that I'm not a tradesman and I don't keep tradesmen's hours. <laughs> and it always seemed to me a wonderful kind of illustration of what he thought a university was about. And just one final story about him, which is legendary. It was in 1968 when we had the city. Uh, I was still at school, but there was a city in down at Bremner because the university had behaved shamefully in relation to Archie Mafiji, a black anthropologist when the university caved in, when the government refused to admit him as a member of staff. We should remember our past. We really should. And um, there was a protest of students sitting in at Bremner at the time, consistently for quite a long period. And a group of Stellenbosch students, seemingly reflective, I suspect, of some of the students that Judge Compepe has spoken about in her recent report, <laughs> decided to come and basically beat the hell out of the UCT students. And there was going to really be trouble. And Professor Baynard, who kind of was a Roman lawyer, who thought of himself as sort of, you know, uh, almost a, a, a Roman a Roman general, sort of strode out. I mean, his house was called Tusculanum. Um, strode out and met these Stellenbosch students who were about to break in. And he said to them, you know, not a good thing that you should come in here and try to cause violence for students. It, it, it won't be good for your university and it won't be good for you. A long discussion took place. And he then said to them, I'll tell you what I'm prepared to do. I have a friend who runs a hostelry down the road, which at that stage was called the Pig and Whistle in, uh, in, in, in uh, down in Main Road, Rondebosch. If you all go there, all the drinks are on me. And they all disappeared. <laughs> solved the problem. So he was a true character in many ways, but the much more important thing about him was we always have to evaluate people as products of their time and then ask ourselves a series of questions. What would they have done today? And what do we learn from them? And what I learned from Baynard were a few things. As I said, the basis that there should be a critical approach to law, which is why I'm sure he'd be absolutely delighted if a 21st century Ben Banner was here to listen to a lecture that we're going to get this evening uh, of a slightly different kind to the traditional private law lecture, if I may say so. <laughs> and secondly, um, I think he was somebody who is deeply committed to the fact that the university and the law school should actually equip students for the needs of an education that was certainly going to transcend apartheid. And I say that because um, in the 1950s, it was important. He and others in this faculty wrote a whole series of articles which were very influential in relation to the colored vote cases of the 1950s. So he was a person who really had a deep commitment to the idea that, in a sense, academics shouldn't just be passive, but be activists in the particular context in which he was located. And so thank you for uh, letting me say a few words about a man that I think we justly honor and, and we should honor, and that his memory should inspire us to produce students who basically are equipped to deal with the present and the future, and who, who essentially are equipped with a critical understanding of every aspect of law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis, for those inspired words. Um, I was myself reading, I'm, I'm sure you know it, Ben Beinart's 1952 article on law and sovereignty today. And already in 1952, Beinart is absolutely clear that the idea of sovereignty cannot just come from the concept of political sovereignty as parliament's sovereignty. 
he insisted that they must be a hold on sovereignty and that that hold must come from law. Um, and so he was very much of the opinion that when it comes to the fundamentals, um, sovereignty must be constrained by law, that law is, is what is fundamental and not um, the political, as um, we might hear from Reingart tonight. So it is my pleasure now to introduce Professor Reingart Nethersoll. Professor Nethersoll obtained a German university entrance certificate, the Abitur, in Göttingen in 1964, and with her South African husband settled in Johannesburg. After studying literature and art history at the universities of the Witwatersrand, Zurich and Cologne, she embarked on a university ca career that culminated in the professorship of comparative literature, the youngest professor at the University of the Witwatersrand, in a department she founded and guided until 1999. In 2000, she followed her husband to the US where she lectured on modern, postmodern, postcolonial, and global literature at the University of Richmond, spending the long American summer vacations teaching continental philosophy at the University of Pretoria during the South African winter. Professor Emerita of Comparative Literature, she now returned to Johannesburg to do full time research, trying to complete some long standing projects at the intersection of science and the arts and law and literature, with special emphasis on epistemology, knowledge production, and transnational dissemination from the 1700s onwards. Her more than 100 scholarly contributions to local and international specialized journals demonstrate her wide-ranging authoritative knowledge in the humanities and her passionate interest in the philosophy of language and the power of discourse. Countless invitations by universities in, amongst others, Britain, Canada, Switzerland, Germany, Denmark, Poland, Austria, and Hungary testify to her international reputation. Professor Nedersal was kind enough to send me a CV before, um, before tonight's lecture, and I just want to point out an, uh, a few things that stood out for me from the CV, that, from things that we haven't heard yet. So um, before she became Professor Emerita in Comparative Literature, she was Honorary professional, Professorial Research Fellow in the Graduate School for the Humanities from 2000 to 2015 at WITS. Then something that also stood out for me in terms of fellowships and grants was the Research Fellowship in Comparative Literature at Harvard University in the spring semester of 1989. I want to read you the titles of a few of her contributions so that you can have a sense of the wide range of Professor Nethersoll's um, academic endeavors. Professor Nethersoll, as I think of her, is very much a Renaissance woman. Um, and um, her work speaks to that um, um, undeniably. So, her contribution for the Acta Juridica 2022 is entitled Piercing Incomprehensible Power, um, and it is a reflection on um, not only power in Foucaultian terms, but it is very much also a reflection on law. It's probably the, the essay in the, in the journal that, is, that has most uh, directly to do with law. Professor Nerissa also pub publishes in German, she recently published in the Gute Lexicon of Philosophical Concepts an article called Wechselseitigkeit, Wechselseitig, Reciprocality, Reciprocal, Mutual. In Philosophy and Rhetoric in 2022, she published a piece called Unspeaking Munitionism. And in the Rutledge Companion to World Literature, she, she, she published a chapter called World Literature and the Library the library receptacle resource record. And us here at the University of Cape Town having suffered so recently from a library loss, really appreciate work that is being done in relation to the library and its preservation. <clears throat> um, in Javnos, the public, she uh, recently published um, 
a piece called Virginia Governor's Executive Order Number 51, how control, consent, and care collide in emergency laws. Um, and then just two more. Um, in, uh, uh, in an edition um, that was titled Violence, Slavery, and Freedom Between Hegel and Fanon, she published a piece called Shards of Hegel, Jean-Paul Sartre's and Homikai Baba's readings of the wretched of the earth. Professor Nedesal is also, in addition to all her other achievements and, um, and interests and publications, she is particularly interested in the work of J.M. Kutsia, and she recently published in 2020 a piece called J.M. Kutsia, Reluctant Public Intellectual. She has in preparation a book-length manuscript entitled J.M. Kutsia's Jesus Trilogy, with no saviour in sight. So um, that, in short, is a bit more about Professor Nethersoul. Um, I also just want to add one more thing, which was that um, I, I noted with glee in the, in the CV as well, um, the forward and introductions that Professor Nethersoul wrote to the Standard Bank National Arts Festival Winter School Collection of lectures. Um, which is scholarly publications in the public domain. And um, so uh, really uh, uh, an all-rounder, um, if there ever was such a thing in the humanities. <laughs> so I would like to invite Professor Nedesal to present the lecture that she has entitled Law at the Intersection of Law, Rhetoric and Interpretation with Kafka's Trial. Thank you. very much. I'm a little intimidated by this wonderful introduction. And I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and of course, my lecture uh, is really a tribute to three persons, uh, names you have already heard, namely Ben Beinert, uh, who is in whose honor I'm speaking to you, uh, then Professor Jakob Barnard Dodé, who initiated and produced a magnificent fest trip of Philippe Joseph, uh, Joseph Salazar, uh, and certainly, and most importantly, I address my thought exploration, I call it thought exploration tonight for you, on the intersection of law, rhetoric, and interpretation. To Professor of Rhetoric uh, and Head of the Eponymous Department, Distinguished Professor Salazar, who is a recipient, of course, of the first shift that you have already seen and will, I hope, look at in a little while. Uh, and uh, this, of course, is the most prestigious academic accolade. And thank you, Jaco, for this wonderful masterly production and introduction of the whole thing. So we are in a festive mood tonight. And with that, and uh, somewhat committed to a Greco-Roman, a Judaic philosophical tradition while aspiring to share the African experience, I wish I were skilled in ancient Greek praise poetry and, of course, in Isibongo. For then, I would praise Philippe Joseph Salazar as one who uses, uh, as the Zulu poet says, quote, peppery words that stab, that carry spears and arrows to spur us on to responsible action. And I would add, in the words of the Greek poet Pindar, quote, if ever a man strives with all his soul's endeavor, sparing himself neither expense nor labor to attain true excellence, then must we give to those who have achieved the goal a proud, a proud tribute of lordly praise and shun all thoughts of envious jealousy. To a poet's mind, the gift is slight to speak a kind word for unnumbered toils and build for all to share a monument of beauty. That's Pindar. But because, as you can gather, I'm neither in Bongi nor a Pindar, my praise will be prosaic and centered on a reading of Franz Kafka's novel, The Trial. Advocating, and this is my mission tonight here, so to speak, advocating for the vital function of aesthetic writing in relation to the discipline of jurisprudence. And I shall highlight critical rhetoric and critical hermeneutics as a crucial for interpretation, 
thinking all the while along storytelling lines. The trial is particularly opposite because it bespoke, its bespoke story reflects the pathos of a human being having to live in an incomprehensible, fully administered world, devoid, devoid of justice. Condemned to victimhood, Kafka's protagonist, Joseph K., exists in a callous, bureaucratic state that resembles a state not too dissimilar from that described in Eskian Pashlitha's first collection of short stories, Man Must Live. In such dismal surroundings, the human nevertheless keeps asking the basic ethical question where to draw the line, in the words of Pashlila, between good and evil, on a, road, a journey towards knowledge of self and of his relation to the community and the issues which affect the lives of all. End of quote. Is this not also the quest of all jurisprudence? to transparently safeguard the line between right and wrong? And is this not achieved by effectively utilizing discursive language, always mindful of the fact that language is not a transparent medium? Importantly, I thought, umteta in Zulu means to speak, to judge, making language pivotal, despite claims to the contrary that say, very often today, quote, Bodies mediate concepts through feeling and action, and organizations and other institutions mediate concepts through their own structured and structuring practices. <clears throat> End of quote. But there's no law without verbal signs, spoken or scripted. Did Moses not bring the sacred Ten Commandments to the Israelites engraved on two tablets? And what about the sixth century? We see a Athenian statesman Solon. He wrote, he did not give the sexual law to his fellow citizens in writing. And is it not scripted language laid down in the South African constitution, which provides the guardrails for our democracy? <clears throat> An ontological view of language avows its power. For instance, philosophers like Paul Ricoeur and Hans Georg Gadamer regard language as crucial link between self and world. The world is linguistically constituted. Therefore, traffic between self and world demands verständigung, meaning comprehension or understanding. However, understanding is essentially a historically affected event in which are particularly shaped horizon of knowledge and experience formed by our respective cultural tradition and education requires for contact with another, be it a person or a text, a dialectical merger of differently composed knowledge horizons. My world, your world have to meet through a comprehension, as you all know, of course, in your profession. Every person exists within her own potentially expandable horizon demanding intelligibility through the dialectic toing and froing between one's own, between one's own perception and that of another. We are all interpretive beings with recourse to critical hermeneutics and critical rhetoric that link the what is being said to the how it is being argued with critical rhetoric shaping the various power relations that cause willy-nilly between interlocutors of every persuasion. At the intersection of the what and the how resides aesthetic writing or well, letters, literature with a capital L. But what about law? It, its story and origin is buried so deeply in historical our historical unconscious if you don't even think of it. So let's reprise it first etymologically and then mythically. The word law, as you probably know, is derived from Old English lagu or laga, plural, from Old Norse lag, lag, meaning quite literally something laid down, 
that which is fixed or set as in, for instance, the German Gesetz, set down, meaning set in place. And from the uh, 1560s onwards, this being fixed or set in place, law, in other words, law, became in physics a proposition which expresses the regular order of things. So there's this merger as law and order. Coupled with law, of course, emerged the idea of order that in turn became the much repeated cry for law and order, heard, of course, at nauseam ever since 1796, when it was first sounded to quell unrest following the aftermath of the French Revolution. Interestingly, Indo-European languages commonly use different words for a specific law and for law in the general sense of institution or body of laws, like the Latin lex means a law, as you know, in contrast to jus, jus, a right, especially in the sense of a legal right law. Interestingly, French adopted the same designation with la loi, derived from its Latin cousin lex, meaning law, while le droit means right, law, duty, fee or title, added to which is la justice, justice, law, fairness, justice, the, the judiciary. Now I find it interesting that the French constitution of 1791 <coughs> distinguishes further between droit naturel and droit civil human rights and personal rights, significantly complicating the balance between the various parts of law, not without dire consequences for a world, valuing identity and human rights. You know, there is this kind of disjuncture, which I think occupies all our minds so much. The intertwined original triad, law, right and justice, takes us in the West back to Athenian or ancient Greek nomos, the term nomos is passed in a pastoral sense, to graze, to pasture, is associated also with an act of distribution, sort of to deal out, and hence it has to do with spatial ordering. <coughs> Thus, Carl Schmidt, in his treatise, The Nomos of the Earth and the International Law of the Jus Publicum Europeum, would interpret nomos as meaning Landnahme, declaring the appropriation of land as originally constitutive act. Now that means the law, nomos, was birthed in violence, the view with which Schmidt debunked normative legal thinking concerning the birth of law in contractual agreement. Normative legal theory thus tends to ignore the law's constituted and constituting violence that marks its birth and is its necessary praxis. The ancient Greeks, like Pindar, among others, pictured nomos as a personified law ruling over gods and men, demonic spirit of, and with divine violence. Though not a divinity himself, but rather an aspect of Zeus, nomos is for Pindar, quote, the righteous seal of all, the seal which stamps whatever the earth contains, nature's firm basis, and the liquid plains. Ever observant of the upright mind and of just actions, the companions kind. Foe to the lawless, with avenge and ire, the steps involving in destruction dire. Come, bless, abundant power, whom all revere, but all desired with favoring mind draw near. Give me through life on thee to fix my fight and never forsake the equal path of right. Now that all-powerful Zeus and Nomos, according to Hesiod's Theogony, fathered daughters, wrote, eumonia or good order, dike, justice, and blooming Irene, peace, who mind the words, the works of mortal men. End of quote. Dike, meaning custom, is the goddess of justice and the spirit of moral order and fair judgment. 
She is usually depicted blindfolded, carrying, as we all know, a balanced scale to symbolize impartiality of judgment. Significantly, she, along with her sisters, frames the work of responsible judges and guards the wealth of mankind. The ancient Greeks did not know the relatively modern concept of right, even though they differentiated clearly between nomos and physis, the body of law, especially governing human behavior in contrast to physical existence or nature. Particularly in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, the fraud relation between nomos and physis formed the subject of vigorous debates among philosophers such as Socrates and the Sophists. These debates posed fundamental questions still important, I think, for us today, namely, is justice simply a matter of obeying the laws or does justice have some basis in nature? If the laws conflict with my natural needs and desires, why should I submit to them? Is society itself natural and law merely imposed? Are legal norms and legal rules to create stability in personal, private, public life constraining human flourishing that might be better served by heeding the nature or natural custom? This question essentially circling the triad justice, order and peace pivoted in Sophocles' play Antigone. The play posits the head of state and lawgiver and thieves, called Creon, against his defined daughter-in-law, Antigone. And Creon, having become sovereign after Polynices' rebellion was squashed, forbids his burial, thus arranging Polynices' sister, Antigone, who under cover of darkness proceeds to bury him, following kinship customs, irrespective of political exigency. In short, loyalty to family and divine law, usually placed with nature, finds itself in deadly conflict with civic order. Obedience to man-made laws ends in a fatal clash with natural law. At least since Antigone's tenaciousness, the nomos versus physis question often reframed as positive versus natural law, has challenged legal philosophers, including Hobbes, Rousseau, and countless others. In matters of political authority and the rights and obligation of citizens to organize and manage peaceful existence amidst multiple publics, it confronts us still today, particularly in South Africa. So now, finally, what about Kafka? Armed with the methodology of critical rhetoric, so masterfully espoused by Zalazar and demonstrated in his first trip, executed so expertly by Barnard Naudet, and also adding critical hermeneutics, I'm finally taking you on a reading of Franz Kafka's The Trial. Pay close attention to the ways in which it questions my perceived assumptions and opens me to new insights. My reading will demonstrate, I hope, besides the need to render visible the workings of law, the need to transfer critical interpretation from the domain of literary studies to the domain of jurisprudence. The English title, The Trial, only hints at legal procedure enfolded in the novel that the German original, Der Prozess, The Process, spells out referring to unwieldy litigation that overwhelms the protagonist, Joseph K. Written in 1914, the trial belongs to the genre of court drama, albeit without a heroic defense lawyer like Atticus Finch, whom we know from To Kill a Mockingbird, and not to mention, of course, the popular LA law spin-offs. In contrast, Kafka, a trained legal professional with a doctorate in jurisprudence, 
delivers with his famous novel a devastating critique of the legal fraternity incapable of delivering prima facie evidence for its, puzzling indict for its puzzling indictment and dubiously arranged hearings that never produce a verdict. Kafka's is a critique of judges. Sorry, guys, <laughs> girls. Kafka's is a critique of judges and solicitors far surpassing Kleist, the broken judge, or Dickens' scathing portrayal of greeting advocates in Bleak House. Kafka quipped once. A lawyer is a person who writes a 10,000 word document and calls it a brief. He would have known, having completed an obligatory unpaid clerking stint at the civil and criminal courts in Prague, followed by his appointment at the Workers' Associate Accident Assurance Institute for the Kingdom of Bohemia. No doubt, no doubt, his experience as insurance assessor involved with investigating and assessing compensation for personal injury to industrial workers brought him, like his protagonist, Joseph K., into daily contact with the inefficient, corrupt, bureaucratic ecosystem of a Habsburg imperial outpost that was Prague before World War I. In fact, the novel unfolds <laughs> the very stasis of the managerial state where jurisprudence largely educates itself with litigation for the sake of litigation and pecuniary gain, perhaps not too dissimilar to what we sometimes see in South Africa. <laughs> <coughs> in the novel, matters, images of abject squalor in dubious locations like broom cupboards and attics, amongst others, populated by badly paid public servants in an environment ruled by deception and distrust, represent opaque bureaucratic glares, labyrinths, the proceedings are secret, says the novel, and the organization is such that officials lacked any relationship with the people. The hierarchy and upper echelons of the court were endless stretching beyond the purview of even those who belonged to it, says Kafka. Such wretched descriptions of assessment of the law's workings disgust reader, me especially, on learning that in the maze of clandestine control, quote, no file is ever lost. The court never forgets, end of quote. <clears throat> Frequently, the trial is read, and the trial is read as a portrait of Auschwitz, but such reading, I think, relegates the text to a specific, albeit to horrendous moment in history, without considering the situation from which it emerged. That situation, reveals a socio-historic socio context defined by impenetrable hierarchical power exercised by badly paid officials trapped in an inscrutable bureaucratic labyrinth riddled with deception and solid by cronyism. In the novel, the representative of the court, supposedly arbiters of social order, show themselves incapable of acting decisively being no more than insignificant cogs in an, in an illegible, albeit ubiquitous state machine. A machine whose intransient churning leaves the experiencing subject Joseph K. powerlessly exposed to the vicissitudes of invisible state agents. Significantly, Kafka's classic tale of administrative Paroxysms begins with a sudden rapture causing, quote, great disorder throughout in Joseph K.'s quotidian petit bourgeois bachelor existence. The pedantic lodger and meticulously conscientious bank clerk K. becomes quite anxious when he is visited in media's race by three mysterious representatives of law enforcement. The narrative merely surmises after sort of matter of fact, quote, someone must have been telling tales about Joseph K. For one morning, without having done anything wrong, he was arrested, end of quote. Although not immediately obvious to the English reader, the iconic opening statement, someone must have arrested him, with its performative legal speculation, situates the protagonist 
as unmistaked victim of an act of libel and slander accusations. Something rendered unambiguous in the original German conjunctive phrasing, jemand musste Josef K. verleumdet haben, denn ohne dass er etwas Böses getan hätte, wurde er eines Morgens verhaftet. Somebody must have, so it's a conjunctive, it's this kind of speculative <coughs> moment with which the novel opens. And clearly the term verleumdet, slandet, blind, has moral and legal connotations. Tying it to the verdacht uh, or suspectia that sets into motion the operation of law and justice in every legal process, uh, alluded to in the German title of the novel, namely the procedural logic process, a procedure uh, consisting of three steps, accusation or indictment, defense, and thirdly, verdict or judgment. These three steps follow suspected transgression of normative rule. And it is not surprising, therefore, that Agamben, the philosopher Agamben, can discuss Kafka's enigmatic construction of the K characters in the novels The Trial and The Castle in the context of Roman law and Christian theology. There, Agamben suggests, quote, the accusation is perhaps the judicial category par excellence, without which the whole edifice of law would fall apart the indictment of being within the sphere of law. And he continues, when being is indicted or accused within the sphere of law, it loses its innocence, it becomes a causa, a thing, that is a causa or a case, an object of litigation, end of quote. In short, the accused is a thing, a case, subject to law and order, and no longer in charge of her action. This is it out of the blue by three court messengers brandishing an arrest warrant, and their names incidentally revealing the multicultural character of Prague society at the time, with Rabensteiner being German, Kulic Czech, and Kavanagh a Jew. Joseph K. is shamed in front of his unsuspecting, caring land landlady and fellow lodgers humiliated in his dignity because he is supposed to have done something wrong, something bad, K is fast becoming an object. Gumbin's thing reduced to powerlessness by suspecting force. Put differently, the obscure workings of the legal apparatus relegate K to the impotent status of an accused who no longer an actor, has become a mere defender. As such, she is reduced to passive recipient of an action he no longer controls. But the controlling instance itself, the law, that is supposed to administer order is in disarray. For the court arbiter of normative ethical conduct, ideally guided by the triad order, justice, and peace, is itself suspect fraught as it is with deception and wrecked by what the text calls personal connections between those responsible for administering judgment. Not surprisingly, suspicion undermines trust in institutions supposed to deliver order and provide anchorage for an agent, safeguarded her homeostatic well-being. But, quote, if one felt that Nothing was certain, as the text states. The moral scaffolding, scaffoldings of justice system originating with Moses' divine and Solon's profane laws disintegrates. In the past, mental and emotional security and certainty were proffered by belief in the sacred. But a secular age of suspicion depicted in Kafka's narrative calls that very belief into question. Moreover, an emasculated actor in a defensive position, like Joseph K., forsaken by the institutions, anguished and insecure, feels disarmed and no longer in charge, subjected to uncontrollable forces. That is the reason prompting 
an increasingly desperate care to search for helpers, albeit of the most unlikely kind, especially women, as the priest notes disapprovingly in the novel's penultimate chapter. But the helpers, among them well-meaning fellow lodger, Fräulein Börstner, case supportive uncle, and an enigmatic artist, and even the symp sympathetic priest, Kay Meets in the cathedral, are unable to dispel the confusion arising from his sudden arrest. Meeting with these helpers merely intensifies Kay's anxiety. As the gentle impotence grows, the more an absence of accusation becomes apparent. And we never learn, says the text, what accusation the first submission was trying to refute. And the narrative speculates just before Kay's execution, quote, logic may be unshakable, but it cannot hold out against a human being who wants to live. Where was a judge he had never seen? Where was a high court he had never reached? He raised his hands and sprayed his fingers. The proverbial gesture of surrender. No wonder. Kay's mind, since his sudden arrest, is filled with suspicion that numbs him. And he desperately desires recognition as actor and agent in control of his fate. In the language of Husserl's philosophy, Kay stealthily seeks control of his noetic in the psychic, lacking recognition because of his thingness having become a case, as we heard Agamben say, he literally becomes paranoid. Paranoia that ab abandons the mind to feelings of suspicion and fear seeps into Kay's trial, especially since the rationale of his arrest remains mysterious. In the absence of rational causation, either legal or religious, that would tie indictment to law-breaking, any authoritative explanation of his case by either the justice system or religious body are suspended. The link is severed between an act event, that's the arrest, and its reason for the transgression of a law, together with a sense of what might have engendered the guilt, thus confounding legibility of the law. What's more, by not defending the life of mortals in their claim to the law's function, a story undermines in its arbitrary workings the very legitimacy of the law. For the dubious trial produces, for the dubious trial pro, uh, procedures, ultimate, culti, I beg your pardon. Let's hear this again. For the dubious, trial procedures culminate in the protagonist's death without conviction. Though innocent, Joseph K. is killed at the end of his of the story, as he himself says, like a dog. And only shame transcends him, since it seems to K. that, quote, shame will live on after him, end of quote. According to Benjamin, the shame that outlives Kay's death is not so much Kay's shame before others, but others' shame for Kay, for Kay. This kind of existential humiliation experienced by Kay, Benjamin regards as Kafka's quite strongest gesture. It makes those who feel it experience their morality in the closest possible manner. Similarly, Adorno, who saw in the devaluation of shame, the sign of private life reduced to commodity status, and therefore ultimately disposable, thought shame, quote, the moral minimum. Significantly, Joseph K., figurative embodiment of a disposable subject, seems capable of only minimal emotion, namely the very moral minimum, for donors, namely shame. A single affect, shame, lies at the heart of the novel and bookends the plot. For the reader of the trial, for, uh, for the reader of the trial, Cartesian certainty vanishes, 
imploding visit the world's intelligibility, not only before the eyes of Joseph K, but also before ours. The text, resisting consumption, implores the understanding, hence necessitates interpretation. <clears throat> and nothing underscores more the centrality of interpretation than the dialogue between the priest and K as a spa over the meaning of the parable of the doorkeeper. Nested, as you will recall, in the enigmatic ninth chapter of the trial, the parable, first published independently from the rest of the novel, served Derrida's famous readings of Before the Law and the Force of Law, the Mystical Foundation of Authority, which in turn generated numerous critical responses, including, including one from Agamben. Importantly, Kafka, by utilizing a church setting for the parable, subliminally references the two sources of law we discussed earlier, the sacred and the secular. The reader will recall that Joseph K, after prolonged and frustrated dealings with lawyers, including the near dismissal of his attorney, is called by name by a priest while ambling through the dimly lit cathedral. From him, the priest K seeks elucidation and explanation of his mysterious case because, as it turns out, the priest is entangled in the incomprehensible workings of the court. Given the enlacement of law and theology and ethical norm giving mentioned earlier, it should not surprise us then to see Kafka linking court and church, two institutions moreover for whom issues of correct understanding are pivotal. And nothing demonstrates better the centrality of interpretation than the lengthy exchange between K and the priest over the meaning uh, of a parable of the story that is told. Significantly, of course, a parable is that powerful literary form that of itself achieves comprehension, thus denying easy naturalized or what you call common, easy common sense understanding. Moreover, the priest who narrates the story of a man from the country who seeks access to the law carefully passes understanding and interpretation. For Kafka's priest insists that, quote, what is written is unchanging. It is only opinions that differ. The inscription in its linguistic materiality, in short, remains and can be reconstructed like the proverbial smoking gun you all know of in court in, that constitutes a manifest factual evidence. Says the priest, I told you the story exactly as it is written, the priest maintains, linking narrative performance to inscription. But meaning does not automatically protrude from the said smoking gun nor does it from a text, both require contextualization. And it is here where fundamentalist adherence to authorial intent is deluded. Rather, after having established the accuracy or correctness of the transmission between, the, between sender and receiver or original and copy, there remains in the challenging assertion of the priest the need for interpretation. Says the priest, uh, Correct understanding of something and misunderstanding of the same thing are not entirely mutually exclusive. So neither K, the recipient of the orally transmitted parable, nor we as readers of it can conclusively understand why the man from the country apparently waiting his whole life to be let into the door of the law that had been kept open just for him did not enter. However, the priest's final arcane statement captures what philosophical language evolved, namely that discursive language as non-transparent medium renders all discourse indeterminate. The ambiguity of discourse, discourse recur claims, results, quote, from the unscreened polysemy of the words. Thus, discursive, in contrast to numerical language, has a denotative and a connotative side to it. Its semantic and semiotic aspects do not merge seamlessly 
the word usage depends on historical and cultural context, a fact overlooked only too often by legal systems that have naturalized universal legal language as normal trigger for law enforcement in support of order and power. Zinon bedeutet meaning and reference or meaning and significance, as a language philosopher Frege demonstrated, cannot be separated. And with Frege in mind, Recur speaks of the what of discourse, its sense, and the about what, its significance. So we bring together rhetoric and hermeneutics. So, where does that leave us in respect of my telling you that the trial is about the limits of Cartesian certainty, about frustrating judicial opacity and corrupt management. To arrive at these possible interpretations, I had to render the text legible as well as comprehensible. By restoring in close, exact reading Kafka's narrative text, I do what most jurists do, of course, as you know, I render it intelligible. But if I want to also understand and assess its meaning, I require a frame of reference or critical hermeneutic beyond the universally generalizing language of traditional precedents. Whereas Kafka's ninth chapter set in mythical echo chamber of theology and law demonstrates any belief in mere restoration of textual eligibility undercuts the plurivocality of an archive specific situatedness. In addition, we must recognize an ubiquity of the force of law with its authoritative power, the ubiquity of the force of all discursive language. Even such dismal judicial procedures as can be seen in the work of Kafka as a trial infer, infer the performativity of language. So in Joseph K's case, his very life is affected not so much by authoritative <clears throat> law but by the lie someone must have told about him. Kafka, it seems, recognized in the emphatic pathos of lies spread by public opinion in even more affective power than in the consequential decision-making by judges. And that is a lesson we as readers take away 100 years after Kafka's telling of defamation and vilification in a dying empire at the eve of World War I in our digitalized economy of attention and outrage that we experience on social media today, lies and slanders are the order of the day. And buried under the thick layer of clickbait-driven outrage, they seem they seep into our lives, allowing for record growth of paranoia in a controlled society, shaped increasingly by fake news, constructed an extensive con in our society sort of overtaken by fake news, perhaps in summary, as we all experience, constructing an existential reality, <coughs> more kafka than Kafka, our world more kafka than Kafka. But before that reality, nothing is more urgent, I think, than to fully realize the power of interpretation and to inquire, in the words of our honorary Zalazar, quote, into the sexual and contextual recondition for persuasive speech. But what else I would say, I add, needs to be done in law school, besides activating what Salazar calls, quote, you can read this in the book, uh, criticism in its two senses here, the informed and attentive reading of legal materials, as in literary or cultural studies, but also the engaged study of how social and political forms are produced, reproduced, modified, and challenged in the substance of legal speech and legal writing. Now, I'd say law schools should be encouraged to escape from the narrow confines of the inherited disciplinary boundary, something which you said, sir, of course. And not only should they take on board rhetoric, as happened here at UCT, but also, I think, literary theory and criticism. Then, prospective judges and other legal professionals might be familiarized more effectively with the persuasive interpretive force required to secure Pindar's application to nomos for the equal path of right, particularly in view of balancing the competing goals of subjective rights 
and collective cooperation in an ever more complex world. I think many of you, of course, will know uh, of the debate in North American Law Journal sparked by Martha Nussbaum, a book, uh, Poetic Justice, The Literary Imagination and Public Life. And as you know, there, the philosophy chair in the Cardoso School of Law strongly supports the study of realist fiction like Dickens's Hard Times for the purpose of, as she says, helping judges to practice more em empathy with an excused, accused. A great number of years, law schools have taken up Nussbaum's suggestions and included canonical narrative fiction in their curricula. Though I am highly actually critical of Nussbaum, a particular uh, slant on literature, because uh, I think it, you can see that also in much better on Netflix TV, I think. <laughs> you know, this is not what I want to see identified with what I call aesthetic writing. But I nevertheless do believe aesthetic writing is, in this, is an indispensable addition to legal studies to create a deeper understanding of languages working. And therefore, I end with all of you. You have been such wonderful listeners. Thank you also very much. And I want to just suggest fewer case histories and more stories from different language literatures, even in translation, and especially in multicultural, pluriverbal South Africa, with its multiple archives of diverse narratives, politics, and customs, make legal language and procedures more transparent by considering different cultural sensibilities. And yes, let's understand better the court's workings and see how it, its practitioners argue their case responsible, responsibly by weighing the demands of DK justice, Genomia, good order, and Irene. Piece. So, to embrace the challenge involved, perhaps you would like to start and read Herman Melville's short story, Billy Budd. It's not a South African story, but Billy Budd is wonderful to show you what perhaps aesthetic writing can do. Thank you all very much indeed. very much, Ryan, that, that <laughs> inspiring lecture um, made me think about a lot of things. Um, and I was thinking about Nussbaum just as you started mentioning her um, and Nussbaum's plea for the literary imagination um, and lawyers um, and, and just really the literary imagination as, a, as an essential part of citizenship. Um, not just for lawyers, disciplinarily speaking. Um, I've just been told that William Beinart, Ben Beinart's son, is online this evening, so I would like to welcome him. Um, we unfortunately don't have time for questions and comments, um, so we're going to move right along, and I have the pleasure of introducing William Joseph Salazar, Professor Salazar is an I1 rated scholar. He has been an I1 rated NRF scholar um, for as long as I have been at my career. <laughs> so, um, that first, um, he's the author of more than 30 books with a number in print and in process. Um, he is the director of the Center for Rhetoric Studies, a former Dean of Arts at the University of Cape Town. And um, a friend, a very dear friend. And so I would like to ask Philippe to speak to us um, and share whatever he needs to. Thank you. <laughs> I'm I speak without notes. But a friend of mine said, Philip, don't do that because you tend to add, you tend to ad lib, and you ad lib, you say horrible things. <laughs> I do your, usually in my lectures on teams, you know, I go off the tangent and I tell the student it's recorded. I say it is recorded, but it does not exist. 
and we'll find it puzzling. I'm just, by doing that, I'm just doing what politicians do. I never said that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a, for me, it's an emotional moment, although I'm not the emotional type. Um, emotionally, the sense that there is motion in it. That's something I tell always my students. Don't think that emotion is something that's going to twist an argument. An emotion makes people move into doing things or not doing certain things. So proof by emotion, by pesos, as we say in rhetoric, it's nothing to be to laugh at or to deride. It's something to look at very seriously. So for me, it's a moment of emotion because apart from the piling up of praise I had to suffer this evening. Um, but with my mother, I've been very, I've been, I've been well trained you know, in suffering praises. Um, it, for me, it's, an, it's very, it's emotional because it shows emotion in my 40 years career at, at, at UCT. Uh, because in 96, about two years after I was appointed to what you'd be called a chair in those days, where there were no full professors, there were professors. You know, now we are full professors. So I wonder what is an empty professor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can think of a few cases, not here. Um, my first public talk at a conference was at a conference that Rengard organized at Witz in, on emerging literatures. And I remember inflicting on the, in the audience in my broken English, which is Lot less broken today, but still quite broken, my broken English, and a long expatiation on Gilles Deleuze, A Thousand Plateau. <laughs> I can tell you, I remember being up there and think people actually keeling over. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1986, so the first time I had, as a young professor, empty still, you know, an interaction with a colleague at this was with Rengard. And here we are in 2022 with Jaco, as I say in the French way, Jaco. So both of them are really the, 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 the I would say, the terminus aquo and the terminus ad quem of my engagement in rhetoric in South Africa. You mentioned I came to South Africa indeed at the prompting of Louis Althusser, the French Marxist philosopher, to study racial discourse. No one in France wanted to touch that thing, you know, and I was warned, you'll be ostracized by your college I, be, I belong in front of a very select small college. You know. uh, we had Jean-Paul Sartre as a student. An interesting place. And, and I, did, I was ostracized by my mates. And it's only in the very recent years that I rekindled the relationship I had with them. Um, they had all sorts of misconceptions about why the young man leaving behind what was supposed to be a, a regular French function, functionary career in academe. I went to South Africa without able to speak a word of English on top of it. I did Greek, Latin and German at school, you know, that is the classic. <clears throat> so here they are standing at both ends of this career. And, and that helps me actually give you a few, a few pointers about rhetoric at UCT. One key figure who understood what I was trying to do was our past vice chancellor, Stuart Saunders, the most remarkable vice chancellor I've, we've ever had, I believe. It's a personal belief, it's an opinion, so you might disagree with it, but I'm allowed to state an opinion. And Stuart Saunders, to whom we owe all the, all the links of UCT with the foundation in New York, the Mellon Foundation, and I mean, all the money that had come to us, to put it bluntly. Uh, Stuart Saunders was a high intellectual. And he realized that I was growing something odd called rhetoric. He didn't know what it was. I told him, and he gave me the idea to create the Center for Rhetoric Studies. And John Martin, who was an engineer, an intelligent engineer, I would say, <laughs> ingenium engineer, told me one day, Philip, why don't you create a PhD and a master's degree in rhetoric? So I told him, well, there's no department of rhetoric. He said, no, 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 that's not how it works. Our university should work. When a scholar develops a discipline, you create a department around that research. You don't try and fit scholars into departments or compartments, as it used to be called. 
this great vision of Stuart Saunders and the remarkable team of DVC he had then was to try and see whether well, there is a researcher. So we try and accommodate the researcher. In the sciences, it's far easier. In the humanities, it is extremely difficult. There's nothing more conservative than the humanities. In mm -hmm. fact, the tie I'm wearing is not a tie from the humanities. It's my old tie as Dean of Arts. Because we had something called the arts at UCT, the liberal arts. And that was collapsed with all sorts of things that didn't work very well, which I will not name. It was a great disaster. So Stuart Saunders, a great VC, understood as a scientist himself and a medic that research was being done. So let's create, couldn't create a department, of course, but a nucleus of researchers. And I can see in the room here and also there on the screen, Quite a few of my, of my past master's degree and PhDs, and they are here today. And they come from various, from various angles, because rhetoric, as Aristotle used to say, it is not a science. It doesn't have its own object. It is a method, a highly rigorous, methodical method. So my students come from media, political science, anywhere. I have a student from medicine, actually, and we apply. Um, the first PhD in rhetoric, and he's, he's there, it's Sifizan Gesi, was two, in 2000, we had the first PhD in rhetoric, working on the Open Democracy Bill in Parliament. He was not a lawyer, but you applied the tool of rhetoric to understand how arguments are being exchanged in the chambers to create what was called then the Open Democracy Bill. A purely rhetorical angle. Two students this year, three, I have three PhDs are great in this year in rhetoric. One on how justice is mediatized rhetorically in the press. Brilliant report. Another one studied how between the NCOP and the provincial legis legislatures, arguments are not are traded and not being actually understood. And the third one traced the idea of the argument, what the fools would call the rhetoric of nation building, what we call the argument, it's a set of argument of nation building throughout two presidencies, herself actually being a civil servant in, in parliament. They are all employed in civil life, which I find very interesting. They are senior staff or they are academics. And it has been a great joy for me over to all these years at UCT Thanks to Stuart Saunders, we understood that rhetoric had a place at UCT, that the program could unfold. I always tell my students, beware when, when someone is doing the praise of something, she or he is praising herself or himself. We call that epidactic in rhetoric. So whatever I say, I say no. So I don't want to talk about myself, but I'm talking about the center. And I want to name or recognize our American friends say the contributors to this volume. First, the cover. You, you might wonder why my name is on the cover. Well, the photographer is Eric Dockstader, the professor at the University of South Carolina, editor of philosophy and rhetoric, and a luminary in rhetoric in America, uh, the philosophy of rhetoric. And he was walking through the woods and he chanced on, he builds log cabins, you know, that's what he does for, for fun. Uh, to build a log cabin is like building an argument. Quite the same, you know. To build a log cabin, you need to have the wish to do the log cabin. This is called pesos. You need to know how to cut stuff, you know, and this is called logos. And you need to have some authority to talk to the tradesmen in the wilderness of New Mexico. You need ethos. So you build a log cabin, you put rhetoric in action. So he took that photo and uh, he suggested to use it on the cover. And so Eric um, is, is watching us with his class in rhetoric from Columbia, South Carolina at the moment. Hello, Eric. Um, contributed a remarkable chapter on the rhetoric of we need more humanities. We must defend the humanities. And he pulls apart completely the, the, the pious thoughts that often uh, leads to wanting to defend the humanities without even thinking of what it is to defend something. You should read it. In that 
Bo in that first shrift, the first shrift in French is called mélange. Mélange en l'honneur de. Uh, we, don't, we don't say first shrift, it's very Germanic. You know, that's right. And the friend of mine always says, you know, the, ger the, the Germanic mind is methodical even in error. <laughs> in fact, it's not him who said that, but never mind. Um, there's a, well, in fact, there's a French philosopher in the, in the, in the Liber Amicorum, as we should say, uh, Pascal Angel Engel, with a rara avis. He's probably the only living French analytical philosopher. <laughs> And uh, his, his works are well known in, 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 in the United States and in France. And he, is, he has a passion for truth. So his chapter is interesting because he sees the difficulty we have in, in critical rhetoric to deal with truth, actually. I get you to read Pascal. Pascal and I, we go long, back a very long time. We, we cross paths in our respective colleges in 1975. And we found each other again like lost intellectual lovers four years ago. I read a remarkable article of, article of in where you attacked savagely one of the main proponents of the new sophistry in France, um, who happened to be a very good friend of mine. <laughs> That's what we do scholars. I'd like to recognize Cheryl Glenn. Cheryl Glenn um, has possibly written in the States the very best books on how to write rhetorically, Cheryl Glenn. And she invited me in 2000 and, uh, <clears throat> 2007 to deliver the, a keynote in a place I never heard of. It's called the Triple C Convention, the College Composition Convention. I'm missing one C. Basically, the largest congregation of English teachers in the world. And there I was lecturing them on reconciliation and, uh, and the language of reconciliation. We are very good friends, a remarkable scholar in spite of being a distinguished professor at Penn State and, uh, and a specialist in feminist discourse. She co-wrote it with Jessica Enoch, who is clearly from Maryland, who is clearly going to take over from the baton. I don't know if lady scholars pass on the baton, but you know, maybe it's a bunch of silly jokes. I would, I would say maybe a lipstick, you know, but <laughs> the kind of jokes I haven't said, I haven't said it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, you will notice in the volume that two Argent Argentinian scholars are present. One is Claudia Hilb. Claudia Hilb is possibly in Latin America, the best Straussian, especially of Leo Strauss scholar. And uh, Claudia and I have worked extensively on the TRC report. In fact, we produced together a partial Spanish translation of the TRC report on the steps of the French translation I made with another colleague or another colleague made with me. And I don't know, the Argentines had a dictatorship and they are still struggling in fact with amnesty, pardon, punishment, vengeance. Uh, I attend in some of the trials, actually, that they are, they are difficult moments, you know, when, when in the audience, people are holding the portraits of all those who have disappeared or been killed, and the accused are faced with that forest of portraits. Uh, no shouting, no screaming, there's a portrait going up. I've never seen more severe rhetorical indictment than lifting those portraits. I say rhetorical because it was making an argument. The face was ethos. The name, the name was a logos. And the holding up, that was pathos. This is how we do rhetoric with my students. So Claudia wrote a remarkable article on, was it correct? to condemn Eichmann and what was at stake in that trial. Being a Jewish scholar herself, you know. The other one is Alejandra Vitale. And Alejandra and I, we work together on repression. And she has developed a remarkable body of work on the archives of repression in, in Argentina. 
and how um, the various rules, manuals, um, even the way the barracks is organized for the Securidad, where it was rhetoric in practice, arguments that put forward, arguments were being implemented. And as Professor Nedersol said in a truly remarkable lecture, we live, we live linguistically. The world is constructed linguistically. Animals and trees don't live linguistically. We do. Toward the end of the, let me say that two of my students have contributed to the book because that has been Klaus is here and Sisanda is here because I always insisted in, in the 10 years that we had the African Yearbook of Rhetoric, which wouldn't have existed again without Stuart Saunders, and later on with the support of the Mellon Foundation by having students coming into the stream, and I thank the Mellon Foundation here for their foresight. I mean, they funded Rhetoric in South Africa. Um, because I always insisted to have junior scholars mixed with senior scholars in our publications, and on an equal footing, not being there because it's a debut paper, but you put your argument forward. And I'm glad that Sisanda and Klaus has here because they contributed two remarkable papers to this volume. Um, there's someone else, which I'm going to name now, is my friend Dominique de Courcel. Dominique and I, we go back a very long time. And not only she worked for the French government on reporting on corruption, Remarkable report of the Prime Minister on corruption in the French, the French civil service some years ago. But she was also initially a specialist of Spanish mysticism and St. Teresa of Avila. Apart from the fact she, she works in four and five different languages, there is no contradiction for a rhetorician to work on feminist mysticism in the Baroque age because mysticism was conceived as being, a, as being a corruption of the doctrine of the church, a corruption, a potential corruption of, the, of canon law, and work on corruption in a modern state. Because again, what we look at are sets of arguments and how they transport so through time. So I hope I have done, I've given you, uh, I hope I've not forgotten anyone here, I don't think so. Uh, I forgot, of course, Jaco, we introduced the volume. In a truly, um, it's both pyrotechnics and it's a kind of uh, high wire act in which he manages to introduce the volume, introduce the arguments, reflect back and, in, and bring in new arguments. It's a magnificent piece, I can tell you, uh, because, because I think so. And that's my best way of Thanking you, thank you, you red guard, judge, and and all of you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, I can now invite you to drinks and uh, other refreshments in the common room downstairs on level four. Thank you very much for being here and for honoring us with your presence.